take a little time try to study the Bible. <coughs> Turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 15, and verse number 28. And Galatians 4, verses 9 through 11. Acts 15, one hand, Galatians 4, and the other. These are very important scriptures. Very important. These are the kind of things that you ought to be praying about. When I, when I cover them, you'll see why. Father, I need the gift of teaching now, Lord. Holy One, I bless your holy, holy, holy name. You give me one more opportunity to stand before you and represent you. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts 15 and verse number 28. The scripture says, after they had the first council in Jerusalem, Paul, the apostle, came down from Antioch and... Uh, they had, to, they had to deal with the issue of, uh, of uh, Judaizers who were having a hard time transitioning from the, uh, from the, uh, from the Jewish uh, tradition and uh, faith into the faith of Christ. There's a transition going on. And in Acts 15, verse 28, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. All right, now this is the beginning. What is this? This is the beginning of the, of the requirements upon Gentiles who are born into the kingdom of God by the new birth and become by that, by virtue of that, members of the church of God. All right, now it progressively is revealed further because the apostle Paul has further revelations given to him as it relates to the church. But you need to understand that once they hammered this thing out with the Jews in Jerusalem, nothing, is, nothing, nothing about circumcision, nothing about the Sabbath, nothing about keeping the feast days, none of that, none of that is put upon the Gentiles. They simply go back to Antioch with this. Now go to the book of Galatians chapter number 4 and verse number 9. Galatians 4, 9. And here the Apostle Paul deals with the church of Galatia. This is a Gentile church. The Apostle said he was the, was the Apostle to the uncircumcision as Peter was to the circumcision <clears throat> Galatians 4 9 but now after that ye have known God or rather are known of God how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements what a thing <laughs> wherein to you desire again to be in bondage watch this now lest there be any doubt about what he's talking about ye observe days and months, and times, and years. Look at verse 11. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Now, if you're not a Bible scholar, simply Bible reader, and you read this, how would you interpret that? Do you not believe that the Apostle Paul, if he felt like that these Gentile converts should be observing the Jewish Sabbath, the seventh day, the day of rest, that he would have inserted it here to make certain there'd be no confusion about this whatsoever. But he made it very plain to them, no Sabbaths, no days, no weeks, no observances, that you are to set aside and observe. Now, keep in mind, let's continue further. Colossians chapter number 2, verses 14 through 17. This is why Paul is hated so much. Colossians 2, 14. The apostle says to the church at Colossae, another Gentile church, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, 
he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Therefore, let no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. And notice days is in italics, simply put in for clarity. Shabbat. Uh, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. He wants to make it as clear as he can to Gentile converts. Don't ever let anybody try to put on you any of the Jewish ordinances, regulations, and say that was carried over to us to observe today. And then in Romans 14, Romans chapter number 14 and verse number 4. He comes at it from a little different perspective this time. And here's what he says, Romans 14, 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Now watch carefully the way he deals with this. He's already made it plain <coughs> that it is not incumbent upon a believer to keep Sabbath days and so forth. But watch how he deals with a weaker brother, one who is vacillating, one who's uncertain, and his conscience won't allow him to receive the full liberty that he has in Christ. Look how he deals with him. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. You see that? You see that? That's as plain as it can be. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. What's that mean? It means this. Let's say that you've come out of a church that is a Sabbatarian church. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventists are not the only ones that are Sabbatarians, folks. I've seen, uh, there's a group called the Seventh-day Church of God and others who are Sabbatarian. What is a Sabbatarian? A Sabbatarian is one who keeps the Sabbath. Not Sunday, folks. Sunday has never been made the Sabbath. They keep Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath. That's why they call themselves, they are called Sabbatarians. Can you, be a, can you be born again and be a Sabbatarian? Absolutely. Absolutely. Why, certainly you can. The apostle just dealt with it right here. He said, if you've got a brother that esteemeth one day above another, in other words, he sets one day aside and says, this is a greater day, this is the Sabbath day, I'm going to keep the Sabbath, let him keep it. Let him keep it. Let him keep it. And pray for the Holy Spirit to give him light and give him wisdom and show him in Scripture how that, uh, that, that uh, the Lord will honor that day, but he'll also honor Sunday. He'll honor Monday. He'll honor Tuesday. Now, of course, tradition has it that we meet on Sunday because it's the first day of the week. It's the day he rose. And the apostle says to lay aside on the first day of the week when we come together, you know, to take up the offerings. That's fine. But there are those who meet every day. You say, what's wrong with that? Nothing. <laughs> In the early church, they met every day and went from house to house. You see, the issue is not something written in stone where God says you've got to meet this day or that day. He writes it in your heart. And as the Holy Spirit begins to give you light and you begin to understand, well, this is my brother. He wants to keep the seventh, the seventh day, the Sabbath. Fine. He's my brother. Let him keep it. And I don't want to offend him. But I know that in the sight of God, if the Son make you free, you're free indeed. And our rest is not in a day. Our rest is in Christ. And the book of Hebrews spells it out plainly and says that they could not enter into that rest because of unbelief. So the issue, therefore, becomes uh, how do we deal with people then who tell us that, we are, uh, that, we are, that we've received the mark of the beast because we, that we meet on Sunday? And, of course, they go back in history and tradition and find out where the Roman Catholic Church announced Sunday or changed uh, Saturday into Sunday to be the Sabbath, and the church met on that day. Remember this, daily from house to house they went, and they worshiped the Lord, the early New Testament church did. So we meet on Sunday. Can we meet on Monday? Of course we can. Can we meet on Tuesday? We meet any day of the week. One man esteemeth man, one another esteemeth all the, the same. These are four powerful scriptures in the New Testament to show you how that, uh, that, that you are not bound to a day. You are bound to a person. 
Christ is the resurrection. Our rest and our Sabbath is in a person and not in a day or an event. So, uh, so that's, the how, that's how you deal with it. And so uh, I want to show you that because that helps you begin to understand uh, the other part that I want, to, I want to bring, refresh you with this morning, and then we're going to move on. Uh, remember what this woman said. I'm going to quickly read her what she said about the Apostle Paul. <laughs> She's a reflection of contemporary uh, cafeteria theology. That's what I call it. Amen. What's a cafeteria? How many have ever been to a cafeteria? We didn't have restaurant in school. We had cafeterias. <laughs> we went through the line, you know, got to, well, I want this, I don't want that, and this and that and so forth. I was glad to get anything I could get. <laughs> but cafeteria is a pick and choose and what have you. All right, that's the kind of theology that's going on today. It's pick and choose. Here's what she says. I believe Yahushua is God in the flesh who came to earth to redeem mankind, was crucified on the cross, arose three days later, defeating sin and death. I believe his salvation is available to all races and nations and that the new covenant replaced the Old Testament seed line of Israel. Big statement. Those who worship and follow him are the new Israel, regardless of seed line, race, or nation. I believe that while the pagans glory in the suffering of Yahushua on the cross, we are to glory in his resurrection. I believe the KJV purposely mistranslated the name of the Son of God from Yahushua to Jesus and that this Jesus being taught in the majority of churches today is not Yahushua himself, but Satan. That's a big leap. I believe the KJV is the modern day Garden of Eden containing the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil through the two different gospels being preached throughout it. The gospel of the kingdom, tree of life, taught by Yahshua, and bring to you another gospel, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, taught by the false apostle Paul. One leads to eternal life, while the other leads to apostasy, error, and away from the teachings of Yahashua and his twelve apostles. I believe there are twelve apostles appointed with the Lord, not thirteen. Matthias replaced Judas, not Paul. I believe John's warning at the end of the book of Revelation of adding to or subtracting from his book was exactly that, his book, and doesn't pertain to the KJV since it didn't exist at that time. Churches abuse this passage to keep their sheeple in apostasy and under religious mind control. I believe the KJV contains the inspired Word of God, but in itself as an entirety is a manipulated manuscript, leaving out the inspired books of Enoch, Jasher, and Jubilees referred to in the KJV, and replaced with a Roman Catholic agent provocateur, Saul, Paul, whose books teach and replace the gospel of the kingdom with his own gospel of grace, which leads readers away from celebrating the feast of the Lord and into adopting pagan rituals and customs. I believe that Paul's amorality, becoming all things to all people, compromised the way and truth of the gospel of Yahushua, which grants adherents a license to sin mentally, and leads them into false doctrines such as tongue speaking of the rapture of the church and negating the celebrating of the feast of the Lord and the, fall, and the Father's commandment of celebrating the Sabbath on the seventh day, Saturday. I believe that close to 99% of the false teachers in the churches today are based on, uh, false teachings in the church today are based on St. Paul's teachings leading people astray. I believe Satan has an offspring on earth as quoted by Yahashua, the apostles, and taught in Enoch, known as the serpent seed line. And that Saint and that Saul Paul was of this serpent seed line, and the very one Yahashua warned us of before he left. I believe Daniel's warning, they shall mingle with the seed of men. Daniel 2.43 is the fulfillment of the seed line today. I believe the Jews governing Israel today are the fake. Khazars, I'll talk about them in a moment, Khazar Jews and serpent seed line Jews who are running the nation on a political ideology of Satanism, Zionism, and a new world order rather than a theology. I believe the Holocaust was implemented by these Talmudic worshiping serpent seed line Jews, such as Adolf Hitler, who wanted to eliminate the Torah, Yahushua <laughs> believing Jew, so the fake Jew could establish their own homeland of Israel to be dominated by themselves. That's a mouthful. 
I believe the New World Order and Zionism are mere forms of Satanism and working together to lead the world into the worship of Satan and paving the way for the arrival of the Antichrist. I believe that aliens and UFOs are fallen angels and will fulfill Joel 2 and Revelation 9 in the last days. I believe that America is the last days Babylon prophesied in Revelation 18. I believe the elect in the church are two different groups and that there are two groups of 144,000. The first group being the elect, the second group being the church. I believe that it is the apostate woman, the church, who will give rise to the Antichrist, Revelation 12, through their support of Zionism and the New World Order. And here's what you get when you read this. You get a compilation of all of the, of the wild schemes that are floating around out there on the internet and various churches and places. And this woman has uh, accommodated all of this stuff into her belief system. That's the best way to put it. But she has sure done some attacking and assaulting in doing it, hasn't she? She says the, the King James Bible is not, is not uh, the inspired word of God. It contains it. it says the Apostle Paul's demon-possessed. She says the Jews in the Holy Land now are European, European Khazars. She says that Hitler was used of the devil to try to destroy the real Jews so that they could build a homeland over there or propagate the homeland for the Europeans, the Khazars who financed him, where did all his money come from, so forth and so on. She's saying a lot of things in here that you ask yourself the question, how could somebody get so messed up? Talking about other books being, being a, not a, a part of the canon, uh, being inspired. Yes, sir. She contradicted herself right in her paper. She called St. Paul. And that just didn't seem to say anything. Well, I, it was my mistake in reading. It's Saul Paul. Saul Paul. That's my, my mistake. Yeah, she didn't call him saint. It was Saul. Saul was his Hebrew name, Saul of Tarsus. And Paul was his uh, Greco name or his Roman name. Uh, so what I just read to you now... Uh, that um, the Sabbath day, did I, I gave you four references in the New Testament. Made it clear. Now notice, in Acts 15, who wrote that? Did Paul write Acts 15? Luke wrote the book of Acts. Luke, one of the, one of the, uh, one of, the uh, of uh, 12, wrote uh, Acts. All right? Luke, the beloved physician. Not one of the original twelve, but one of the apostles added later was Luke. Okay, would anyone doubt the uh, the uh, uh, inspiration of Luke, Gospel of Luke? Of course not. He's accepted as one of the synop so-called synoptic gospels. All right, Luke wrote Acts fifteen. Paul wrote Galatians, Colossians, and Romans. He wrote those three books. Is there anything in Galatians, Colossians, and Romans that disagrees with Acts fifteen? No, absolutely not. Nothing, nothing whatsoever. Uh, here's a little synopsis of what, of what Paul did say about the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this. Uh, from what the Apostle Paul had to say about the Lord Jesus, we learn he had a Jewish ancestry. He was of the Davidic descent. He was born a virgin. He lived under the law. He had brothers. He had 12 disciples. He had a brother named James. He lived in poverty. He was humble and meek. He was abused by the Romans. He was deity. He taught on the subject of marriage. He said to love one's neighbor. He spoke of his second coming. He instituted the Lord's Supper. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross. The Jews put him to death. He was buried. He was resurrected. He is now seated at the right hand of God. Is there anything wrong with any of that? Nothing. And that's what the Apostle Paul taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to try to defend Paul. If I have to, if I, if, by defending Paul, obviously, I'm defending the scriptures that he wrote. You either believe that Paul is an inspired writer of scripture and apostle chosen by the Lord on the road to Damascus, or you don't. If you don't, you don't understand the New Testament. Yes, sir. Come out right out and say it. 
That's exactly, well, you can, you can, uh, you know, here's the thing about the Catholics. Uh, it's like a Jew. They've got a thing called a magisterium. And uh, the, uh, there's another thing that's called uh, a nuncio. And there's, they, have these, they have these Latin words and terms that refer to certain offices in the Catholic Church that a Catholic is supposed to believe this, 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 this. But the truth of the matter is, I just quoted to you last week, these Catholic theologians, these Catholic astronomers that believe that our Savior is going to come as some little green man or something out of space that's going to come down. Does the Pope believe that? I don't know if the Pope believes that. Does the Catholic Church teach that as, there is, as the catechism? They have a catechism. A catechism means that these are the things that we believe. This is what we're supposed to believe. Does the catechism in the Catholic Church say that? I don't think so. The bottom line is this Catholic may believe this, this Catholic may believe that, and this Catholic over here doesn't have a clue what's going on. <laughs> it's like the Jews. So what do the Jews believe? Which Jew? You talking about the Reformed Jew? You talking about the ultra-Orthodox Jew? Or you talking about uh, the various... Uh, levels and sects that within like Kabbalah, the Kabbalistic Jews, which one are you talking about? You know, conservative Jews? What do the Jews believe? It's the kind of thing where you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't nail them down to any particular thing, but, uh, but it's obvious that there are elements in the church that believe it. For example, somebody said, well, what do Christians believe? Who are you talking about? <laughs> you know, it would be like that. So you get, in, it's a, it's a, you get into a thing that you can't, you can't deal with quickly. What do Christians believe? Well, if you're a true born-again believer, you believe Jesus Christ is God Almighty. Amen. You believe when he went to the cross, he paid the sin debt for all of mankind. And that it cannot be added to, it cannot be subtracted from. You believe that he died on that cross and he was buried, he was dead, his body was dead, it was laid in a tomb. And for three days his body laid in a tomb and on the third day he arose from the dead. You believe that? And you believe he ascended to the right hand of the Father by his own power, his own righteousness, and his own glory, and that he's coming again to this world. Born-again believers believe in the new birth. They believe in the new birth, and they believe the new birth is by the grace of God. How could it be any other way? It's certainly not a reward for a good life. You can't, uh, you know, that's not going to do it because the Bible says plainly by the by, by the works of the flesh, shall no uh, works of the law, no flesh be justified. And the Bible said, "We've all sinned, come short of the glory of God, and no flesh should glory in His sight." There is no way. There is no way that a human being can live good enough to be saved. In any event, uh, Christians differ on eschatology. What's that? That's the doctrine of the end time. They differ on church polity. What's that? That's the way they organize and run their churches, things like that. Uh, the Independent Fundamental Baptists, like we are, every body or every group of believers is an independent group. We don't take orders from any centralized location for any uh, hierarchy, religious hierarchy. Uh, it's, and it's autonomous. It's self-governing. I think it ought to be that way. I think that's a good way. Because you can sure get into a lot of corruption when you start building an ecclesiastical hierarchy. Uh, yes, sir. Richard Luke believed that Paul and Barnabas were both apostles. He said right here in chapter 14 of the book of Acts, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out. Sure he did. Luke believed it. He did. Peter believed it. Of course he did. Peter believed everything that Paul wrote was scripture. Yeah. Sure he did. He believed it. And for your knowledge, just as a side knowledge, or as a little kind of a sideline, it has been alleged a number of times that the woman who wrote this catechism is a lesbian. which is quite revealing in the sense that people today are so reprobate in their minds that they think they can practice any kind of perversion and still be a Christian. See, and that's the kind of thing that's going on. And uh, so I'll let it go with that. Uh, I wanted to bring you back through that again to show you the kind of the, the, uh, the situation as it exists today. I have never in my lifetime, and I've only lived a few years on this earth, but I have never in my life known a more arrogant, ignorant, rebellious crowd than these people that are out here today. They pick up a Bible, and they act as if 2,000 years of Christians that lived before them were stupid. 
And they're smarter than everybody that ever lived before them. And they're going to reinterpret everything. They're going to change the whole thing. You talk about arrogance. That's arrogance. That's arrogance. As if they're the only group that ever lived that could interpret the Bible. That's arrogance. And of course, look what it leads to. And what it forces, and obviously there's a greater purpose in it. And what's that? They're preparing them for the Antichrist. She's rejected the true Christ. She's rejected him. Yes, sir. Well, the way to deal with it is 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God, Theos, one God, was manifest in the flesh. John chapter number 1, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Those are two plain scriptures right there that say that the Lord Jesus Christ is God. Revelation 1.8 says that He is the Almighty. There is only one Almighty the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter number 9, when the man that was born blind was kicked out of the synagogue and came back to him, he came back to him, the Lord Jesus said, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe? He said, I that speak to thee am he. All right. The Bible says in, Revelation, in the book of Hebrews chapter number 1 that he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Yes. Talking about his resurrection. He was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection of dead, from, uh, from the dead. When the book, go ahead, brother. Well, yeah, the first three words in the Hebrew Bible are Bereshith, bara Elohim. The word Elohim is a plural Hebrew noun. That means three or more. Elohim is a generic term for God in the Old Testament. It's translated in the singular, G-O-D. It didn't say in the beginning God's, plural, created heaven and the earth. The reason is because that plural Hebrew noun is plural in unity. In other words, it's Three, but it is in unity. It doesn't mean three separate different ones. It means three in one. That's what it means. So in the beginning, right off the first verse of the Bible, God, Elohim, created the heaven and the earth. Yes, sir. Well, they challenge authority. You can, be, you can certainly believe in that. Yeah, the, especially First Timothy three sixteen. That's exactly right. Amen. And what laid the groundwork for that was the revision committee in the eighteen hundreds, when they when they moved away from the authorized version. And the revised version of 1889, 80, somewhere in there, the revised version came out. And from that, a proliferation of versions followed. And what's happened today, now this generation that's born now, they don't have church history. They've got 50,000 different translations. And so they read from all these different translations. And it's left up to them 
to be the interpreter and authority because their mind tells them, well, if I got all these things saying so many different things that don't agree among themselves, where do I find the truth? The truth must be in me. That's true. That's true. That's a good, that's a good analogy. Protestant magisterium. That's true. They, uh, if uh, Logston, who was on the NIV committee, uh, Logston, I don't remember his first name, but before he died, he says, I have made a grave error. He wanted to get right with God. Frank Logston, I think his name was. He said, I have made a grave error. I have messed up big time. And he knew he was leaving this world to go out to meet the Almighty. And he wanted to make sure he was right. Like I would, you would, or anybody else would. It's one thing for us to, to, to shoot our little darts at each other. But friend, when you start dealing with the Almighty, you want to make good and sure that you're right. And what you die with is what you really believe. And he didn't believe it. <laughs> he wasn't ready to die with it. Yes, sir. Sure they are. On the internet, thousands, and they have the now it's all prophetic. Used to be in, everybody's a prophet and prophetic and prophetess, and and they're out there preaching like they're they say, do you want to hear what Jesus has to say? Yeah. And, and it's it's all over the internet, thousands of them, and, and they're having big. Well, it all goes back to the to the basic philosophy they were all raised under in school: relativism. Yeah. In other words. I am my own judge, I'm my own God, I'm my own source of authority, and if it feels good to me, it feels good. If that feels good to you, that feels good to you, what have you. They apply that to everything in life. Well, I feel like I'm a prophet just as much as Paul was a prophet, and on it goes. And, uh, they say Jesus is speaking to them. I mean, come on. Sure they do. Yeah. But they, they, have, they probably hear voices, no question. Most of these mass super, most of these serial killers and mass killers hear voices. <laughs> you got to try the spirits. <clears throat> I'm not saying God can't talk to you, but you have to. You got to try them. I listened to one for a few minutes just to see where they were going. Now, he talked scripture for a few minutes, then he said, "We're all going to meet in Egypt, all his fans, meet in Egypt, and be with Pharaoh." I said, "What?" And that's just some Larry, some Larry the prophet. I mean, he's one of the biggest ones. <laughs> It's like the bumper sticker I saw about 20 years ago. The bumper sticker says, I am God. Yeah. I got up in the pulpit the following Sunday and said, let me tell you something. You don't need to tell people you're God. If the Almighty shows up, you'll know it. Amen. You can be certain of that. You can count. He won't have to give you a bumper sticker. You won't, you won't need, any, you won't need any, anything. When the, Almighty, when the Holy Ghost comes into a house, you know it. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, but that, that was the New Age movement. That's when it all started, the divine spark within, the kundalini coming up the spine, the reincarnation connecting with the universe, this yoga stuff where they're sitting today, the seven chakra points in the body. All this stuff is connected with a super spiritual attitude that people have today, like they've tapped into some super spiritual strength or source of strength that a bunch of dummies like us don't know anything about. And so what's happening is today they are tapping into this source and these churches today are letting them sit in their yoga classes and they are tapping into a spirit and the spirit of kundalini, but it's not the spirit of Holy Ghost of the Bible. And that kundalini, kundalini spirit is going to lead them straight to the Antichrist when he shows up. That's exactly what's going on. It's, it's wicked. It's godless. Yes, sir. Brother, isn't this a confirmation of apostasy? Absolutely, brother. has come in the flesh is an antichrist and the man who wrote that wrote revelation too about the antichrist same man same man john he sure did he sure did so uh it's uh 40 years ago the preachers used to get up and preach about apostates having having uh having horns on top of their houses that's back when everybody had an antenna, TV antenna. That was an apostate. They had horns on top of their houses. And, and TV 50 years ago was innocuous compared to what you get today. I mean, it's nothing but pure sewage. But, but back then, 
uh, they preached about a lot of different things as apostasy and then leaving the Bible. They would be shocked to death today to see what kind of apostasy is going on today in 2013. How the scriptures assaulted, how the Apostle Paul's assaulted, the identity of Christ has been changed. All this stuff's going on now, but there's a reason for it. They're getting ready for the man of sin, son of perdition. All right. Well, we've got about 10 minutes left. I wanted to take you quickly through this. The Khazar, let me read to you what a Khazar is. How many's ever heard of a Khazar? All right. A Khazar, ancient Turkic people who appeared in Transcaucasus, Transcaucasia, Caucasia, where we get the word Caucasian, in the second century AD, subsequently settled in the lower Volga region. They emerged as a force in the seventh century and rose to great power. The Khazar Empire extended from the 8th to the 10th century from the northern shores of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea to the Urals, and as far westward as Kiev. The Khazar capital in the Volga Delta was a great commercial center. The Khazars conquered the Volga, Bulgars, and the Crimea, levied tribute from the eastern Slavs, and warred with the Arabs, Persians, and Armenians. Religious tolerance was complete in the Khazar Empire, which reached a relatively high degree of civilization. In the 8th century, the Khazar nobility embraced Judaism. Now mark that down. The nobility embraced Judaism, and Cyril and Methodius made some Christian converts among them in the 9th century. In the 10th century, the Khazars entered into friendly relations with the Byzantine Empire, it started in Constantinople, which attempted to use them in the struggle against the Arabs. The Khazar Empire fell when Sviaslav, Duke of Kiev, defeated its army in 965. The Khazars are believed by some to have been the ancestors of many East European Jews. All right. Now, how many of you have ever heard it said that all of those Jews over there in the Holy Land today are nothing in the world more than Europeans speaking Hebrew. Hebrew speaking Europeans. In other words, they have no real Jewish identity. They just seized upon an opportunity. Here's a piece of land over here on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean that we can fight from generation to generation to generation and watch our children and our wives be slaughtered and murdered. But we can claim that and call ourselves Jews. There are many out there that believe that. They believe that the so-called Jews in the Holy Land right now are Europeans, Khazars, the descendants of the Khazars, that are not really Jews, which comes back to this age-old problem. What happened to the ten lost tribes of the northern conquest of the Assyrians when they took them, carried many of them off captive, 722 B.C., and came in and intermarried or married with them and... Uh, and uh, by doing so, they, uh, they lost their identity. And so what happened to the ten northern tribes? The tribes of Benjamin and Judah were the two southern tribes. What tribe did the Lord Jesus Christ come from? The line of the tribe of Judah. Yes, sir. Yeah, what did he say? centralized locations. In other words, kept their identity in certain pockets through the world. Okay. Aliyah, that's what they call it. Okay. Well, I mean, listen. Uh, here's the bottom line. Uh, you know, he may have, there may be a lot of truth in what he's saying. Because uh, why would somebody, uh, why would, they've have, they have Jews in, in the uh, Arab Peninsula, mm -hmm. you know, which is down below, uh, what is that one where they carry the little knife in their, uh, they all, all the men have a little knife here. Uh, I wish I could think. That's where the uh, USS Cole was blown up. You remember when the yeah. USS Cole? Yeah. Yemen, Yemen, yeah, Yemen, Yemen. A bunch of Jews came up out of Yemen. And they came up uh, and made Aliyah back to the Holy Land. 
a bunch of Jews under Operation Solomon came up out of Africa, Ethiopia, about 20 years ago, and made aliyah to the Holy Land. That's what they call it, aliyah. You've got two Israels. You've got Eretz Israel, which is the land of Israel. Then you've got the diaspora, the Israels, the Jews scattered. Jews have come. The thing is, you've got Jews in Russia. I don't know of a country on the earth. There may be some, maybe. But most countries have Jews. And they still call themselves Jews. They still retain their identity. How many Italians do we have in here this morning? Got one Italian. How many Germans do we have in here today? Got a German over here? <laughs> How about Brits? How many Brits have we got? How about Scots? Irish? Now, which one are you? An American or are you an Irishman? <laughs> uh, I've got part Irish and part Scottish and part uh, German and part uh, Slav, and I don't know what all I got. Me, I have no idea. I just, but you know, here's the bottom line I don't identify myself as that, although I'm, we can check our ancestry and find out where we came from. That's all fine. But do you go about the day thinking of yourself as an Irishman? Of course not. But if you're a Jew, you do. If you're a Jew, you do. Yes, sir. Pastor, I was just uh, recalling that when Christ was brought to the temple, and I remember uh, that uh, <laughs> the uh, old fellow that was there in the temple, that was named Zach, Zacharias, or, but anyway. You got John the Baptist's father, Zachariah? Uh, no, I, I'm thinking of when Christ was came. Simeon. Oh, when he came. Simeon and Anna were the two in the temple. Anna, the prophetess. Asher. Plainly it says. I know. There's a big stink about it. But in Revelation 7, it says that there's 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel and names them. Yeah. All right, it names them. Now, either you look at that and say, well, you know, they represent the church. I was listening to, to a Greek Orthodox priest the other day. Well, let me put it this way. He was a monk. I'm not sure he was a priest, but he was a Greek Orthodox. And he was a Jew that got saved. And the only thing he can talk about are the Jews. I mean, he spends all his time blasting the Jews. But he was trying to deal with Revelation chapter number 7 and the 12 tribes of Israel that are mentioned, mentioned by name, 12,000 from each tribe. He says that means the church. He says that's talking about the different people that come together to make up the body of Christ. I thought, man, you've got to do an awful lot of stretching to make that say that, see. But it, it ha he has to to make it fit his theology because his theology is God's done with the Jew, finished with him once and for all and forever, and the church has replaced him. Exactly. I believe that the 144,000 Revelation 7 are real Jews. I believe in Romans chapter number 11 when he said all the whole house of Israel should be saved. It's talking about Jews. And I believe a DNA analysis would probably help a lot in determining uh, a biological ancestry. But the truth of the matter is you can become a Jewish convert. You can become a convert to Judaism. And that's, that, happens, that happens all the time. Are you any less a Jew? We're not talking about a God-fearer now. We're not talking about the various ranks of the people who were related to Jews. I'm talking about a, become a Jew, you know, 
Don't come under the Noahide covenant where the Jews say, well, if you'll just keep the Noahide covenant, you Gentiles, you're okay. You know, you can appreciate Israel and you can, and you can, you can, uh, you worship the God we do, but you're still not a full Jew, but you can become a Jew by conversion. Right, but, but there's a Jewish geneticist who's done a study. Yeah, that'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Well, I know you don't expect to get in, get into, you know, we're liable to wind up anywhere when we, when we start out in here. You'd have to carry an encyclopedia in here to keep up with all the, the notes, what you're liable to get into. But, uh, but I believe the DNA analysis will do it. I do. I believe it'll make the connections necessary. They can dig up bones and they can find, uh, they can extract DNA, I guess, in certain areas. Yes, sir. Pastor, the Lord has the books. He does, doesn't he? That's the point. He knows. He knows. He knows. All right. Let's pray. Brother Lee, dismiss us, please.